So hi, I'm Jordan Hendricks. Um, to give you a little bit of background on who I am and, and why I care about Weenix, I started out um, my undergrad as a chemistry major and ended up taking a CS course my senior year of college, which um, ended up being a lot later than a lot of my peers that I work with. Um, and I really fell in love with it, loved it so much that I decided to stick around and do a master's. Um, one thing that I really liked about this particular course was that one of the themes of the course was sort of that there is no magic. Um, everything you do, you will build from scratch. So if you want to implement or use a data structure, you're going to implement it yourself. If you want to reverse a list using the, the standard library of this language, you're also going to implement that yourself, which was really appealing to me, uh, made me excited uh, to, to continue in CS. Um, so now I work at Join as a software engineer, which is great. Um, I love systems, which is why I'm here. Um, I'm also on Twitter with this handle. It's a Jordan system, which is a reference both to my love of systems, my name, of course, because I like my name, and also this really obscure 1990s uh, movie that you may or may not have seen called Jurassic Park, um, in which the characters really save the day because it's a Unix system, and they know this. <laughs> so what is Weenix? Uh, Weenix is a small operating system, um, but it's, it's fully functional in all the ways that I think are really important. And I implemented it as a student. It's implemented every year by students, um, at least since 1998, um, from scratch. So you're actually writing a kernel from scratch, which is really neat. The name means the little Nix, as in Unix. Um, and this is a, it was actually coined by Keith Adams, who I hear is in attendance, which is great. So hello, Keith, if you're here. Um, this is a demo of Weenix, uh, my, my Weenix, actually, um, playing around in the K shell, which is the kernel shell. And I'm just like creating files, listing devices. You can see that there are TTYs. Um, all of these files and directories are pers persisted to disk. Um, and then I shut it down. So what sort of features does Weenix have? It runs on an x86 processor emulator called Kimu. Uh, it has intelligent multitasking, meaning it supports processes and um, threads. And you can add multi-threaded support if you want as well. Uh, really importantly, it supports virtual memory. Uh, which is a really, really cool part of the project. You have terminal emulation, um, including like line discipline, terminal drivers, polymorphic file system support. So there's also a, a, an on-disk file system as well as virtual drivers and um, memory devices. And there's an interface to add more drivers if you want. So this is an a diagram of the Weenix architecture. Uh, one thing that I think is really cool about this is that it looks a lot like an operating system. Um, so if you were to make a diagram of Linux or Mac OS X or something like that, it would probably look pretty similar to this. Um, so you can see we have a system call layer, user land, and then the virtual memory <laughs> space is sort of everything, but it includes the kernel here. A virtual file system layer. S5FS is the on-disk file system, which is the System 5 file system, as in Unix System 5. Uh, and we like that because it's simple to implement, even though it's not necessarily something you'd want to use in production these days. Um, process management, TLB management, scheduler, and the other cool thing about this diagram is that almost everything on here, students actually do implement from scratch. The user land portion is provided to you, but uh, the system calls, VFS, S5FS, all of that, um, you actually do yourself. So now I'm going to talk about the evolution of Weenix. This man is showing us the evolution of dance, which I will not do. <laughs> so it starts with the operating systems course at Brown. Um, this is Thomas Stepner. He's been teaching the course since at least the late 70s. And uh, right now, Weenix is a half credit component. So you do get a little more credit for doing this, uh, since it is such a big uh, undertaking. So Tom, also known as TWID, which are his initials and his login to the Brown CS department, has a history of a very hands-on approach to learning. This is Tom showing you what you might do if your program has masked off SIGINT, aka control C. Uh, and you can't kill the program as a result. <laughs> So he is a uh, katana fiend, <laughs> the ultimate <laughs> uh, So how did Weenix sort of get its roots? Uh, in 1977, Tom was teaching this course. And he wanted to have students implement a project that looked like a real operating system. So they started out with an IBM 360-like simulator written in PL1. The project itself was written in assembler. Um, that turned out to be kind of difficult, kind of slow. So they moved to a more um, pseudocode design where you're not actually writing any code, but it uh, teaches you about the Intel 8086. Um, and that wasn't sufficient to really get the hands-on approach learning that Tom really likes. 
So they moved to using a Motorola 68000 emulator that was in C. This was painfully slow, but it did allow them to implement an OS. Uh, it didn't have things like virtual memory or, or fork or exec, uh, but you did have a file system. You could read and write from it, do syscalls. Uh, and this ran on three different types of machines. So this is a Apollo 6800-based, 68,000-based machine in the CS department, and all these pictures are, are taken from uh, by Tom. Um, this is a 68,000-based Sun machine, uh, which was the next year, and then this is a Sun uh, Spark machine. Um, so that was too slow, sort of, to to deal with for the long term. So in 1991, some students wrote a simulator. Uh, that was kind of a generic OS architecture in C. And this was much, much faster. Um, you couldn't really boot from it. It would just load the binary and then run it for you. Um, but it was more like a real operating system. It was Unix-like, still no virtual memory. Um, the next year, they moved to a more Solaris-like operating system and called it Slow, which I think may be a comment on the performance of the system. Um, it was the first to have a name in, in this iteration of projects. And it also featured a microkernel architecture, which was sort of more in vogue at the time. Uh, so then there was another overhaul in 1994 using the same simulator. Uh, instead of using Unix or microkernel architecture, they switched to Sun's object-oriented OS, um, that sort of design, which was called Spring. And ever cheeky, they decided to call it Fall. Um, the projects were written in C++. And then in some next iterations uh, in these few years, uh, the project was called Doors 95, 1995, uh, Doors NT, and Open Doors. They're all very uh, historical and commentator. So now we get into the postmodern age. This is really where Weenix begins. Uh, the simulator underwent a rewrite to support dynamic address translation, which of course allows for virtual memory. The design returned to a Unix design, and this is where the name Weenix starts. There was a brief uh, revolution in which some students decided to do a Windows version of Weenix. This was called HippoS or Hippos. And it did not go very well because it, as it turns out, writing a minimal Windows-like system was a lot more difficult than a minimal Unix system. But it was, it was a good effort. Uh, they decided that they wanted to use a real virtual machine so that they could actually write some boot code. Uh, so they ended the simulator, moved to Zen. This was called Weenix on Zen, which is Wox. And then that wasn't fast enough. <laughs> so we go to Wox on Box. Um, this was a little bit faster. And then finally, we moved to Kimu, which makes it a lot uh, more usable by other schools. And there are a couple other schools. I believe USC was using it at one point uh, that used Weenix as part of instruction. Uh, so some future projects to kind of bring Weenix into the modern age. Uh, there are some students that have worked on and are working on 64-bit support as well as multiprocessor support. And I think this will kind of be the final stage to bring it up to date. Um, that's still ongoing. Hopefully it will be finished this year, as in 2017. Uh, so what are some lessons that I learned from Weenix? Um, I think the biggest thing was that you have all these sort of basic abstractions that you're used to when you're writing systems programs coming from a more introductory systems background, which was me at the time. Um, but not only can you understand them, you can also write them yourself. So this is a piece of the proc T struct in Weenix, which, you know, not everything's there, but you can see it's just a list of fields, a list of function pointers, things that it's responsible for. And you can understand that, and it's pretty straightforward. On the flip side, bugs in these things, in these basic abstractions, can be some really nasty, bizarre bugs because basically your, your foundation of your world is falling apart. And that leads to very strange behavior, not surprisingly. So for instance, when you're implementing virtual memory, there are different portions of the address space responsible for your stack and your heap. And if you have collisions there, you're going to see some very strange things in your function call stack or some weird objects in your heap that you don't understand why they're there. Um, I, when I was working on S5FS, I ran into a very weird bug where I would start up my system, do some reads and writes, um, shut the system down, and it would run all of these checks on, on the on-disk format, um, on the actual disk back in the system, and check whether it was consistent, and it was fine. But then when I would start back up, the system would freak out and say, ah, the super block is corrupted. Well, the super block in S5FS is the first block in the system, and it contains metadata about other things like free lists and where the inos are and things like that. 
So that seemed bad, and I was looking for some really strange, bizarre bug, like maybe there's something weird in the initialization code, or maybe the TAs have a bug in their stencil code, all these different things, and it leads me down to a path where I end up in my uh, code that writes out blocks to disk. And I see there's this giant to-do, implement sparse block allocation. Well, sparse blocks in S5FS are represented as zeros in the array of blocks. So for if you have an inode representing a file, say, there'll be an array of, of what blocks on disk match this file. So first one might be in block five, second one block 10, and so on. Sparse blocks, which means blocks that aren't allocated that are just all zeros, are represented with zero. So when I would actually write these things out, I would say, okay, block 10, I'm gonna write this data here. Block five, I'm gonna write this data here, block zero. What needed to happen was to allocate a new block, right, so that I could fill in a real block on disk. And instead I'd be like, oh, okay, I'll just write to block zero, that's great. Um, and I would corrupt the super block. So basically, these tiny to-dos can go from just missing a feature in your system to really bizarre failure modes that don't actually look like they have anything to do with that. So why do I love Weenix? Um, as we saw in the history, it's generations of work from students. And students in particular, I think, is really cool because how many people get to say they write an operating system, right? Um, I felt like I was kind of among the greats writing an OS. Um, and I like that it's evolved with, with operating systems over time. They've done experiments with um, you know, microkernels and Windows and Solaris and lots of different things. And you get to implement a kernel from scratch, which is really cool. Um, as a student, you have to confront these questions that I listed on, on this slide in a really literal way. Like, why in the world do I need a virtual file system layer? Can't I just talk to the you know, S5MS directly? Well, actually, that doesn't make sense because you might want to have a different file system, right? Um, how do you multiplex processes on a single CPU or other types of resources? How are system calls implemented? Um, all these questions you get to explore. And there is no magic, even in your operating system. So returning to that first course that I took in CS, I get to see that again here. So I asked on Twitter, um, so I claim in the, in the title that this has inspired generations of systems lovers, and anecdotally I know that's true just from talking to people uh, that I know in the industry. Um, but I asked on Twitter for some people to respond with ways that Weenix inspired them. And this first person said, because of Weenix, I'm no longer afraid of big code bases, and I trust that even the most flummoxing bugs have a cause. Um, and this other person said, no matter how complicated the system is, it's always composition, a composition of simple building blocks. And that everything big, every big thing starts out small, and you can build anything if you want to. Thank you.